Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for being with us. Um, we are excited to talk with you today um, in spite of the weather. Um, and again, thank you for making time. We know how busy all of you are with everything going on, and especially on a day when the schedule doesn't work the way that you anticipated it would. So um, we are the Consortium for Public Education. Um, I am here this morning with my amazing colleagues. And Sarah, can you bump me on the slide so everyone can see your amazing pictures? Um, I'm here with Aaron Ultimus, Sarah Brooks, Christy Kuhn, and I am Debbie Pixton. Um, we are all directors for the Consortium for Public Education. Um, which is a nonprofit based in McKeesport, Pennsylvania. We're a little over 35 years old now. Um, you know, we've always, always been about education, engagement, and equity. Um, over the last 10 years or so, we've been really focused on future readiness and helping students be prepared for life after high school. And for us, that generally means that they can answer three questions. Who am I? Who do I want to be? And how do I get there? Um, and so we do all kinds of programming around that. Um, but it's really, you know, educator focused, student focused and partnerships um, really support that work. Um, we got here today because our executive director, Jackie Four and I um, and Christy Kuhn were able to participate in different programming offered by the Edgenomics Lab out of Georgetown University. Um, they do a lot of work around education finance. And we are also trained in human-centered design by the Luma Institute. And so while we were participating in our own professional development around education finance, we realized that there are some great strategies from human-centered design that can really support that. And so we wanted to share with you what those might be it, um, it, with the hope that they are helpful to you. Um, the consortium is always about how can we help our educators? How can we support students? How can we support our partners to have a more thriving region? And so we uh, created this webinar with the hope to do that. Um, our goals for the webinar today are to understand how human-centered design strategies can support collaborative decision-making around budgeting, um, connect the use of those strategies to making decisions related to the discontinuation of the ESSER funds, um, and identify ways that the strategies might be used to build understanding, set priorities, and communicate decisions to various stakeholders. So just a little bit before we get started about what we understand for the current context. We know that school districts have always had to budget, that's not new, um, and those budgets are built on a variety of expected income sources that vary from place to place and they vary from year to year. Every school district is different and their budgets are also different. And this year we have um, more than usual a variety of factors that are impacting those budgets. They include enrollment changes, staffing issues with inflation, not enough teachers, lots of new hires, and then again, that discontinuation of the ESSER funding. This creates a really unusual budgeting climate that will require school leaders like yourselves to make challenging choices that will be influenced by how they, you engage your stakeholders in the budgeting process. Often your most desirable solutions out of these choices Combine consideration of the costs, right, your money matters, but also your identified outcomes, which include, of course, benefits to your students and your staff. Regardless of the decisions that you make, how you communicate your decision-making process and the choices that you make are critical to the acceptance by your community, your caregivers, your students of those decisions. There is a mindset that comes with strategies that we think can help. Human-centered design, as I mentioned at the beginning, um, is, is a process for developing solutions in the service of people. It's built on the premise that if you know your students, your teachers, and your families well, that the education system that you foster will be better aligned to their interests and their needs, and that includes your budgeting. HCD, the way that we talk about it, is always both a toolbox and a mindset for creative and collaborative problem solving. By design, human-centered design invites multiple voices to engage and minimizes the opportunities for one voice to be heard over all the others. It supports transparency in collaborative decision-making, reducing pushback or assumptions of ill will. 
and it provides guardrails for a communication process by keeping participants focused on the goal while limiting opportunities for tangents. Because developing a school budget is at its core, a challenge focused on providing the best educational experience and environment for students and staff, it is a human-centered challenge. While your human-centered mindset remains your lens through this process, depending on where you are in creating your budget, you'll need different strategies. Because we only have an hour and your time is limited, um, we are not going to go through how to implement all the strategies we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about what the strategies are and why you might use them, and then point you to our website, which has a ton of videos about how to actually implement the different strategies that we talk about. Um, they're all there. They talk step-by-step step through the process. They give you tips and tricks. Um, I'm very excited about our videos. I know my colleagues are equally enthusiastic about them. Um, and if you use them and have questions, feel free to reach out to us. We are super nerds <laughs> about human-centered design and would love to talk to you more about them. Um, so now I'm going to pass it off to Sarah to talk about our first set of strategies. All right. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate you being here today on this rainy slash snowy afternoon. Um, so we have this slide deck broken into a couple of different parts based on different methods that we think will help you. Um, so our first part is really all about how to build empathy and understanding um, in terms of really being able to identify like what the budget will be. So um, before you begin looking at your dollar amounts and what you have left, what you will be using, how things will be changing, um, it's really important that you know about your current situation. And that includes what is working in your district, what is not working, um, who have you asked in terms of like what information do you need to gather, and who, who haven't you asked yet. Um, and if there are people in the room that would have a different opinion than yours, you know, typically the loudest person in the room or the person that says no one ever asked me, um, those are the people that you really want to reach out to. However, it's important to be able to identify, well, who exactly are these stakeholders within my school system? So being able to create a stakeholder map is one really great strategy that ensures that you've been intentional about who you're going to invite into this discussion. Um, it helps to identify folks who could potentially be involved or have a voice in solving a particular problem, visualizes the relationship between people and their systems, right? How do these groups of people interact within my entire system? Um, and making this an explicit intentional step, we're less likely to make assumptions about our stakeholders that we work with, um, thereby ignoring any valuable input that they have or trying to solve a problem with incomplete or biased information. Uh, what we've often found is that when trying to solve a problem, the first step is really just to solve the problem and not go talk to the people who are working within the problem every day. Um, so it's really important to be able to identify who has a stake in us solving this particular problem that we have. So a stakeholder map basically looks something like this. You have groups of people, you give them you know, a type of a name, um, <clears throat> and it really also helps to look to see how relationships between those groups of folks um, actually kind of work out. So here is an example of one that we did as a staff a couple of years ago, um, and you can see it got wild. We, as a nonprofit, we work with a lot of different people where we had to have multiple groupings of groupings in order to identify um, like how the different groups of folks that we work with. Um, I think one of the biggest things that we got out of this is we were actually able to go, oh, well, who are we missing? Um, so that was something else, right? So for us, it was like, here are all the people that we work with currently, but we should really be working with these folks as well. Um, so here's just an example of what a, a stakeholder map can look like. It doesn't have to be something that's this intense. It really just depends on, you know, how um, people that you need to bring to the table. Um, sometimes when you do stakeholder, stakeholder mapping, um, your groups get really too large and they get too cumbersome to work with, right? So it is important that you kind of uh, filter that out. 
not every stakeholder has the same importance, essentially. Um, so sometimes you might end up with an overwhelming number of stakeholders. And with any system, uh, depending on how um, my, in minutia detail you get, it um, can lead to lots and lots of different stakeholders. So if you come up with something such as this, um, as you want to include as many people as possible, as I said, it's important to be strategic um, in how you leverage your time and your resources because you're not gonna be able to go out and talk to everybody. So you want to make sure that you are very specific about who you are asking for their engagement. So what we like to do is use a stakeholder matrix. So we basically look at all of our different stakeholders and then we organize them by who has high interest and who has um, influence in solving that particular problem. So a matrix such as this will kind of help you um, to not necessarily include everybody, but your most important people if you are finding that your amount of stakeholders becomes unwieldy. So using a stakeholder map to identify who is in your system, as well as what groups exist that have varying perspectives is really, really important. Once you know who your stakeholders are, uh, you'll be able to realize you know, who have similar perspectives, who have some unique insights that maybe you missed if you hadn't gone specifically to talk to them. So the reasons why folks might have you know, similar perspectives, interests is because of you know, where, what neighborhood they might live in within your district, um, a role that they play within your community, um, their inclusion into particular subgroup, you know, like any of our uh, special education folks or English language learners, like they're all going to have very specific um, perspectives on how their role is within the system. So folks who have particularly unique views or have significant or distinct roles within your community uh, might be worth interviewing um, to understand really the nuances of their perspective. So this is when we get into interviewing. And we're not just talking about job interviewing. This is about having a really particular focus uh, of a conversation with your representatives from your stakeholder groups. So in this get case, your goal is to really fully understand the perspective of your interviewee. That looks different than having a job interview. Um, with this type of interview, you're going to hear directly from a stakeholder one-on-one. -on -one. You're going to build trust and credibility with your interviewees. Um, stakeholders love it when you come talk to them, right? Because they probably have opinions and they want to share them. Um, this also helps you a challenge, uh, challenge any assumptions or perceptions you might have about a particular stakeholder group. Uh, it helps you gather information that is nuanced and helps you pay better, closer attention to topics that reflect greater energy or concern within a group that maybe just because you're not part of that group, you are unaware of. So it's not necessarily this. You're not going to sit down. <laughs> you're not going to have an office space moment. When you're talking about interviewing ex uh, inter interviewee examples, people that you want to have or hear from their unique perspectives, um, these are going to be folks that are, you know, municipal leaders, borough manager, mayor, nonprofit partners, um, service providers, after school program leaders, board members, union leadership, business partners, leaders within your community, um, parents with unique perspectives, especially from your underrepresented groups. In terms of giving uh, an interview, there are a few things that we always, in general, do's and don'ts. Um, you do want to follow the interviewee's emotion. So if they say something like, that was really hard, there's a follow-up question. Well, what do you mean by hard, right? Because hard, something difficult, something fun, that's going to look differently for different people. So it's important to be able to identify what that exact emotion was. Um, it's also important to create safety for the interview, right? Like um, we're not going to share this or this is all going to be anonymous um, because people are more likely to really give you their honest opinions. Pay attention to body language. Body language says just as much as the words that are coming out, if not more. Um, and then wait a beat. Give extra time. Sometimes folks need time to process questions that they're being asked. Don't chime in with your own thoughts. So often when we do this, we have more of a conversation that goes back and forth. An interview is not a conversation. It is not sharing of the information. It is one person listening and gathering information from another person. Let me at Midland County High School for tonight has been postponed. Um, Assume that you know that someone, don't assume that you know what someone means by a given term, kind of going back to the feelings, right? Don't assume that you understand what a uh, particular vernacular might mean. Ask for clarification. It is important that we understand. 
Um, and really stay clear of leading questions. Instead of saying something like, how fun was that? You say, well, how did you feel about that, right? Um, also consider magic phrases, such things as like why or tell me more about are going to draw out more information. Um, if you had a magic wand or in a perfect world kind of unlocks new perspectives, what in this perfect world would this person like to see? Um, tell me a story about that provides clarity and specifics. So it is important to work in certain types of magic phrases to really gather more from your interviewees than necessarily uh, fact finding information. So there are a lot of benefits when you're interviewing targeted stakeholders. Uh, you gain a tremendous insight into what matters in your decision-making process. Um, ensure key perspectives are included in the process and be informed about how you design other parts of your budgeting process. All right, so I'm handing it off to Aaron. All right, good morning, everyone. So I'm going to talk about two specific human-centered design methods to help set budgeting priorities. Now, the following methods are used to help you describe trade-offs among budgeting options and to understand what your stakeholders most value about the decisions you make for your school community, okay? The results you gather from each of these methods, or if you use them in a combination, uh, inform your questions about how the investments you're making impact the outcomes you actually wanna see. We're gonna talk like, Return on investment, what are you really aiming for here? And which parts of the budget are going to get you there? And what parts do your stakeholders find most important? But here's the thing, keep this in mind. Most people don't understand the trade-offs when we're talking about large sums of money. Uh, that, you know, There's all this money involved in school budgets, especially when it's presented in percentages of our entire budget. So we really want to make this a literally human-centered approach to talking about budgets. So consider using per pupil costs in dollars when using any of the methods I'm going to talk about, okay? I'll show you an example here. If we're talking about investments, instead of saying we're going to invest in 5% of our, our tier two dollars, you know, our professional development dollars in project-based learning trainings, reframe that to we are going to invest a thousand dollars per student to support closing the achievement gap bring it down to that student level what is the actual impact on the students in our system what's going to happen to them right same thing if we're talking about cuts if we phrase it as we're going to reduce district budget by six percent that doesn't tell me really anything i don't know what's going to happen to add, you know, specific programming. I don't know what that's gonna have, what kind of impact they'll have on, on education, right? But if we reframe that again, we give it that human-centered reframing, we write that as we're going to reduce the budget by $1,500 per student in a way that still supports student growth, okay? Brings back down to that individual student, especially for your caregivers, that gives them a very clear idea of, okay, that's what's gonna happen with my child. I can see that, I can understand that, right? The first method I'm going to talk about for setting priorities is called buy a feature. It really is, comes down to setting priorities of, do you want this or do you want that? Okay. So the buy a feature strategy allows your stakeholders to demonstrate what they value by choosing where to spend a set amount of money. So they are offered a variety of options. They have a set budget. Okay. And then you have options that are represented representative of the actual cost per pupil. So um, I'll show you an example of this in a, a couple slides. And then the results you see offer a trend in how people prefer one option over another and which option they're least likely to pay for given their dollar amounts, okay? This is a method you would do in small groups or individually so you can look for those patterns among your stakeholders, get those individual perspectives. The analogy we like to use is if, you, if you've ever gone and bought a, a new car, and I, I bought my first new car this year. So uh, sitting down, you have that base model, right? For a car you wanna buy. And then when you go to purchase, the, the salesperson gives you all these on the margin decisions to make, right? You know, oh, okay, do you want the deluxe interior? Do you want the leather seats? Do you want the, the 
special navigation system or the surround sound, uh, you know, added uh, base system in your car? Do you want special rims or blacked out windows? All those little decisions, you have a set budget. You walk into that dealership and you go, okay, I have this amount to spend. Where am I going to make those decisions? What is most important to me? Do I want that interior? Okay, well, then I can't get everything maybe that I want. I have to make certain tough decisions based on my budget, okay? Buying a feature, this or that, okay? So if we're talking about school budget, it might look like something like this, right? And these are based off of, of, of adapted examples from the Georgetown Economics uh, Lab course, right? So if we're talking to parents, would you rather maintain current staff and cap class sizes at 25 students per class? Or would you rather have that funding to maintain current staff with cap class sizes at 30 students and provide some free extracurricular activities for students? It gives them some choice, but it gives them parameters, right? They can't pick anything. They have to make some decisions, right, within the parameters you provide. Principals, would you rather hire a vice principal or provide teachers a stipend of $5,000 for some extra duties of your choosing? What is going to fit within the outcomes you're looking for? What is most important to you, right, in that role as that stakeholder? Or if you're talking to a teacher stakeholder group, would you rather apply $14,000 to your benefits of your choosing and then keep the money that you don't spend? Or would you rather have $14,000 spent on a set of district chosen benefits? Okay, it gives them some voice and choice. And this comes back, you know, Sarah talked about stakeholder mapping. When you have stakeholder groups, these are the kind of, this is the kind of method you would do with a subset of that stakeholder map. You bring in a group of representative, group of teachers, sit down and have that specific conversation. What do you prefer in this, this box? Sit down with your administrators. What are, what are, what are your priorities, right? Okay. Here are a couple other examples. So which cost equivalent option would you choose to close a 4% budget gap? You know, if you have these four choices, freezing salaries, reducing staff per 100 employees, reducing staff by four to six employees for, and, and raising all class sizes, or selecting substantially leaner health, dental vision plans, et cetera, okay? Giving folks some options. They then can look at their budget and what is most important to them, and they can mix and match and find what fits within that budget limit, okay? That's the buy a feature idea. So keep your stakeholders' perspectives in mind when you make your choices and as you balance the perceptions and needs of each stakeholder group, okay? You're never going to make everyone happy, but a buy a feature process will draw out a lot of patterns and give you some clarity on where those priorities lie. Sometimes you may need to have more dialogue about what, where specific resources are spent, to what end, provide folks with more details, more context. Um, and having a conversation like that can be difficult. And so you need structure, right? This next method we're gonna talk about is highly structured. It's called an importance effort matrix. So an importance effort matrix, it's a highly structured, forced ranking. You have to make decisions. Uh, it's a forced ranking process for comparing and ana analyzing similar investments in a way that requires group consensus and results in clear priorities for making decisions. It requires you to consider how important something is against how much effort it will take. In this case, that's probably going to be a dollar amount. How much are we spending on this and how much return on investment are we getting? Okay. Um, so you're assessing the impact of the investment on specific outcomes. It might be academics, attendance, test scores, um, against how much is this really costing us in our budget right now? So in general, the importance effort matrix may be designed in conjunction with a review of your comprehensive plan or other guiding documents for your, your district. Um, it's a, it's a lead, as a, <clears throat> excuse me, it's a leadership team kind of activity, right? It's not for a large group. You're not doing one uh, importance effort matrix with 50 people. It's a, it's a small group kind of activity and you use it to build off of and refine other information that you've gathered. Um, it needs to be based on evidence, not on personal preferences or even the current situation. What do you know 
is actually benefiting students? What is really working, right? It's a, it's a tough conversation to have and you need to come with um, the data to back it up, really. Remember, when I talk about data though, it's not just quantitative either, it is qualitative. Sarah talked about interviewing, um, you gotta go talk to folks and find out what is really working and, and is it working in the way that it was designed? Are we hitting the outcomes we're aiming for? This is kind of the rough and ready of what uh, an importance effort matrix looks like. So you have, you start with all of your ideas lined up at the bottom and you rank them in terms of importance uh, or impact on a particular outcome. And then you move them up the Y axis in terms of how much effort or how much money they require. Okay, and then you rank those out and you have four quadrants, things that are high return on investment. You see down in the bottom right, strategic things that, you know, they're working, but they also take time, right? They might take investments over the years. You have low hanging fruit pieces down in the bottom left. And then luxury, these are things that, yeah, they're great, but maybe they cost a lot of money and they're not really having a huge impact on, on the outcomes that we have in our district. This is a, a real live example, right? Uh, this was a school that was exploring how to make their, their school um, really just the greatest future ready space they could. And so they explored a ton of different options. Um, some of them, like you said, really like low hanging fruit, you know, having students meet at lunch versus uh, creating some things, things that are luxury like flexible seating, creating adulting workshops, um, doing long-term kind of strategic pieces that you know have costs and have require more effort, like doing internships or having community and business interactions. But you can kind of get an idea of how these things work out here. And there is no such thing as a tie in an importance effort matrix. You have to set clear priorities. We've done these with many leadership teams and districts. And we often start out with asking folks like, well, what are your priorities? And they'll list out 10 things and we'll go, well, what's the most important? And like all of it, like, that's great, but you have to pick a next step and you can't do it all. And it's the same thing, obviously with a budget, you can't have it all. So how do we figure out what is most important? and what is it gonna actually get us where we wanna go. So if we have an example, a budgeting example here, how might we invest our resources to effectively increase academic student growth, okay? If that, say that's a part of our comprehensive plan, our strategic plan, that's our outcome. That is our guiding light, that is our North Star. What do we want, how are we gonna get there? And then if you look at your budget, you say, all right, we have these five initiatives. We have additional, you know, we could, we have looking at additional counselors, reading coaches, added PD time, looking at our summer school, or maybe a tutoring program. Okay. All of these things cost money. All of these things take time, hiring folks, human resources, right? You then have to have that conversation as a leadership team and say, okay, going back to that outcome, where do these things rank? How do we plot these and say, yes, this is actually going to get us to that outcome. This is really important. This is effective. This is not so much. And then you look and move them up and think about cost. And so if we look at this example, again, this is not based on data. This is just our example. We're not, we have no grudge against counselors or social workers, please. No. But if we said, oh, okay, well, uh, adding additional counselors and social workers is going to cost a lot of funds in our budget, but it's not going to hit that specific outcome we're aiming for. Okay. Having that conversation, coming to that consensus helps you make clear decisions and it gets everyone on the same page, every, everyone on board with those decisions. And it's, it gives you clarity for some of your budget decision-making. Once you have your priorities, you need to make your choices and then communicate your plan in a way that fosters acceptance and productive path forward. Right. If you're doing something like that matrix as a leadership team, that's great. You've made decisions. Now you've got to take that out to your other stakeholders and explain how it's going to work. What happens next? Okay. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, great points, great methods. And um, also from Sarah, I do have to like, he mentioned like, we don't have anything against school counselors. It was, it's just an example. It's not based on real data. And it is based on that particular driving question. If you had a different focus for your budgeting, like we want to impact mental health for our students, then those 
priorities, the impact that those different things would have on that particular prior driving question would be different. Um, so make sure you have the right framing question before you would do a method like that. Um, so our last piece is really about helping you make those choices and then um, communicating those so that you can move forward. Um, the next couple of methods are about providing transparency in your budgeting and decision-making processes, telling the story of how you're prioritizing your students, and inviting participation in continuing to benefit the school community. Um, because in the absence of clear information, people will make up their own stories. And we are all very familiar with bad stories that have been told because folks just didn't have the information. It wasn't that there was ill will. It wasn't that there was something wrong. It's just there wasn't enough information. And so people were afraid of the worst case scenario. Um, so the first one we're going to talk about is concept posters and pitches. Um, both concept posters and pitches are really about presenting key points of an idea in a really concise way. Um, obviously the poster is used to visually illustrate your key points and the concept pitch is, you know, your storytelling, you're audibly conveying your key points. Often you use them together to share an idea in order to gather feedback and gain support to move forward, but they don't have to. You don't, you can choose one or the other based on your particular needs. Um, so with your concept poster, your key elements there are you're looking for a visual representation, you're showing how something will work, um, and it outlines the key components in a way that um, people who haven't been involved in your process or were minimally involved in your process, um, they'll understand it just by looking at, at your poster. Um, that concept pitch then is really about your compelling storytelling. You um, can get some real-time feedback through body language or verbal responses as you give your pitch. Um, and you can really anticipate the most often, um, like the questions you're getting the most often um, and the next steps and, and speak to those as you're giving your pitch. Um, in both cases, you're really responding to some prompts, usually questions that you anticipate are the things you think your audience most wants or needs to know. So there's an example, oh, either method or a combination of those two can be used either early in your process when you're initially gathering your input. Um, you always want to clearly label that draft format, or it can be at the end of your uh, process that's more polished. Um, so in this case, where we're talking about budgeting, um, you know, you might consider something like, how might we create a balanced school district budget that ex supports exceptional student learning? And so you want to, you know, address what is your context? Why are we talking about the budget right now? Um, how did you engage stakeholders in your budgeting process? What are the key features in your budget? What's new? What's different? Um, where should people pay attention? Um, how will your budget choices benefit students, right? That's really key in helping folks stay focused on, we are making decisions for our students. Um, where are the challenges that still remain in your budget? You know, um, we always would wish for more money. We would wish for more grants. You never know. Um, so there's always more that you would want to do. And so knowing that you've thought throws through um, can really um, show people that you've been really thoughtful about your budgeting process. Um, Thinking about how will you know if the budget choices you made, um, whether those are investments or cuts, really impacted those student outcomes that you were looking to see? And then how will you continue to engage with stakeholders to refine the current and future budgets? Um, the examples that we have are not budgeting related, but this particular one was a school district was focused on how might we incre increase family engagement in our district to benefit students' future readiness. Um, and in this case, you can see like it was a rough draft, right? It doesn't look super fancy, um, even though it's typed up in this case. And you can see here that they were in a program where they were getting feedback from other um, school leaders. And so those post-its that you see are things that um, that they liked and then and other elements that they thought that the district should say, okay, well, if you're thinking about this, have you thought about this other thing? How have you involved these other folks um, to make their, their idea even stronger, right? The idea with the feedback is always to, how can I strengthen this idea to meet the goals that the group is trying to meet? This example is a much more polished 
fancy, like, hey, we've spent a lot of time, we gathered input, we had all these community coffee chats, um, we got folks' input. And so here, here's what we did um, and where we're going and, and why we think we're going in that direction. What, what are we hoping to see next? Um, it looks much fancier than the rough copy, but that rough copy is really important in showing folks, no, like, no, this isn't finished. I really do want your input and it's, it will impact where we go um, in the future. I mentioned feedback. Um, we always talk about how gathering that input and that feedback is really important, but it's also important to set guidelines to make sure that that's a productive conversation. Um, we tend to use the framework that feedback should be kind, specific, and helpful. Um, you know, your feedback is worded in a way that you would want to hear it. Um, it's specific in that you're you're focused on particular examples of what could be improved or what you really like, you know. Feedback that just says, that's great. That's not, not really enough. I don't know what you like about it um, or what, what I should make sure to keep if other parts of the plan have to change. Um, and, and then helpful. Um, what, what's something I can use to make my idea better? Um, you know, it's we find it very helpful, especially with folks that don't have a lot of practice um, or have had a lot of, of opportunities to provide feedback to clarify expectations about how your feedback will be used. Um, you know, folks who have a different expectation will be disappointed. So if their input will be used to make a final decision, whether it's part of a vote or whether it's just to provide information for a broader conversation, having that lens will really help folks who are giving input um, feel less cranky if their ideas aren't heard. Um, so again, you know, part of the process is helping your budgeting decisions be really accepted by the community, even if you make decisions that weren't what they wanted you to pick. Um, so being really clear about, about that is, um, can be really powerful. Um, so the next example of taking people on, on the journey of your process is a storyboard. Um, and you'll think of this as like, if you are old enough to remember when there were newspaper comic strips, it's going to look like that. But a storyboard is another way to help people follow the path you took to the decision point you are currently at and the choices that you make. Here is a completely fictional but related to budgeting example uh, to help you see what I mean. So in this case, we have a made up ABC school district and the finance team um, is sharing this storyboard based on their budgeting process. Um, and we'll say this in, in March, 2024, when you might be publicly sharing a, a draft budget. So um, in the beginning, during the pandemic, the federal government provided additional funds to us. They were the ESSER funds. And we used those dollars really well. First, we upgraded the HVAC system. That was something that really needed to be done um, and really impacted the health of our students. Um, then we implemented a one-to-one -one device program, K-12, so all of our students could have access, um, at least in terms of the device, um, something that we could control and something that we hadn't been able to do before. Then we acquired some additional resources, um, tools, programs, software for teachers to use to address that learning loss that we were all super concerned about. We also used that money to hire more, more social workers and school counselors to address the additional mental health needs that we were seeing in our students and staff. Because of those investments, we saw great improvements with our students, including a 10% increase in student attendance, a 5% growth in English language arts and 4% growth in math test scores, and a 5% decrease in suspensions. Now the ESSER monies are ending and we have to make new choices. To help us make those choices, we asked you to, through surveys, to identify your top priorities when given options for what to keep and what to let go of for the sake of our students. You said that it mattered that we keep our social workers and school counselors and that class sizes meant less to you. Because of that, we adjusted our 2024-2025 budget by increasing class sizes by two students each and prioritized keeping those staff, um, those social services staff, the school counselors and the social workers to best serve our students. Over the next several weeks, we will be working with our amazing staff through the changes ahead to ensure that we support those families most impacted by these changes. 
You can continue to engage with us by contacting your building principal and sharing any concerns or questions that you have. We value your ongoing conversation and plan to continue to engage you as we make choices to provide the best learning experience possible for our students. So you can see in this example, we take them on the journey, right? We had, we had this great thing and we did, we made good choices with the money that we had that we weren't expecting, right? We used it in the best way we knew how to help our students. And now the situation is different. So we have to make different choices, but we, we asked you for your input. We listened to that input. And so because of that, we are, are responding in these ways. And even though that will hurt some people, we are not leaving anyone behind. Everyone continues to be part of the conversation. Everyone still matters to us. And as we move forward, because we know things will continue to change, you have a way to, a person to contact um, and that the conversation is not actually over, even though we are setting the budget for next year. It's not a one and done kind of situation. So hopefully that gives you a sense of something that you can do that's a little bit different than what we've seen um, happen in places before, um, but can really help with that kind of not leaving, not leaving gaps where people can make up stories about the decisions that you made. Uh, so I'm going to pass to Christy to do our wrap up and talk about the resources that we have available. Hello, everybody. It has been really wonderful to sit here with all of you and listen to our group talk about these important decisions. So just a few wrap up points and resources. So we've talked about a couple of different things, how we can identify and make and connect with our stakeholders, how we can set priorities and how we can communicate those decisions properly. So throughout this entire process, whatever, however you are hopefully engaging with some HCD strategies or not, you always want to remember to engage your stakeholders in your budgeting process so that they can be more bought in and, and you can hear them. So not only do you not necessarily have just a reactive group of stakeholders, but you also have, you have their voices and opinions throughout your process. And you always want to communicate clearly and thoughtfully about what is the why, the how, and the why of just the what, the how, and the why of decision making so that people understand what are our priorities, why have we made those decisions along the way, how did we get to where we are now. So a few basic tips, just as reminders, use language that everyone can understand, use actual dollar amounts and per pupil comparisons, emphasize that some things do have to be given up in order to keep others. So whereas kindness is infinite, budgets are finite. And so we cannot keep everything. We can be as kind as we possibly can all the time, but we cannot have all of the programs that we possibly want. Um, we need to emphasize how the decisions benefit students. We always want all of our decisions from a school district to be based on the student needs. What are our students are at the center? And so what are we doing to really give them the best educational opportunities possible? And then share how this is a value in the investments for students. So these are the strategies that we talked about. Um, when we are thinking about who our stakeholders are, how we can empathetically connect with them and hear them, use stakeholder mapping, use interviewing. When we are in that space where we have to make those decisions and set priorities, try the buy a feature or use the importance effort matrix. And when we are further along in the process and ready to share what we decisions we have made or where we sort of are in our decision making, that's when we can try those concept posters or concept pitches, and then try storyboarding to really tell that story of what you've done. So the main thing to remember is that you want to keep your students, your staff, and your community members central to your decision making so that you will have a stronger and more effective budget. You don't want to make reactionary decisions based on we're losing $16,000 at the end of this month. You want to make a proactive informed decision that is effective for your students and for your caregivers and your educators. You want to meet everybody's needs as best you can. 
All right. And we're going to share with you a brief video that we did with a educator, a superintendent from Butler Area School District. He utilizes HCD in a variety of ways. And so we thought you might like to hear a sort of first person account of how HCD is being used within his school district and how and why he uses it. Human Center Design allows us to get multiple perspectives and sometimes there's quiet voices that have brilliant ideas that don't necessarily step up until they're engaged. And uh, fortunately, Human Center Design allows the opportunity for multiple voices to be heard, not just the loudest voice in the room. Really run whatever is the most pressing issue in our community. Right now, we're doing a lot of Human Center Design work around artificial intelligence and what should the role of it be within our schools. Uh, we have used it to help guide our community engagement strategy to the parents and to work with a number of other entities as well as trying to define how, how do we connect. Uh, we've actually switched our school board's meeting structure from two meetings a month uh, that are sort of the traditional meetings to one meeting a month. And the second meeting we're rotating amongst one each month out of our 10 schools in the evening. And it's really a tour of the building, the walk around and human centered design activities to really engage the community. Because the human centered design activities allow movement and frequency, the board members are getting uh, personal interactions with the community members to show up. And we've had a higher attendance to all those than any of our board meetings in the past. So it, it's been very beneficial as well. And then finally, programmatically, we've taken a blend of things. We can take human centered design and merged that with process called academic return on investment uh, that we've worked with. And using those two things together, it really helps us prioritize and focus our resources on what we believe will have the greatest impact on our students. So budgeting wise, we, we actually use it through academic return on investment because we don't go through every budget line with it, but what are the major buckets of our, our, our spend? And particularly what we have choices over? And how do we make those choices and are they really aligning to our mission and our strategic plan and what our students need? So creating those strategic initiatives is one thing, making sure they actually deliver is another. Then how you decide what you're going to fund really states what your true intentions really are. Choosing AROI and, and human centered design helps us pull that all together. At first, they don't recognize. They don't realize they're being engaged. So we would say, hey, now we're going to do human-centered design activity. We say, hey, we have activity. We like your feedback, your input. And they just start doing it. It, it creates conversation. And, and what you find is people start talking, even though they're asked to fill out posters, they're asked to engage in different activities or whatever the, the visual is as well. So it, it creates a lot of interaction that otherwise just wouldn't be there. And the more, as you watch that churn of interaction, you start to realize the validation they have because they really feel like their voices are being accounted for. You can start off small. You don't have to, you use human center design, you control the process you're trying to work with. And by taking little steps of time, you'll confidence with it like anything else. You don't have to try to go all in on one set activity. You can try a couple small activities and make it part of your overall engagement and then build it over time. <laughs> Okay, so that was advice from a regional superintendent. Um, and I think his advice of start small is really important. So maybe you haven't been HCD trained. Um, maybe you haven't attended one of our lovely training um, opportunities. Um, but maybe you really would like to try one or two of these strategies, um, you can definitely do that. You can start with one or two. Um, you could also get trained by us if you have, if that is something that you would like. And just in general, um, as we all have said throughout, and I think Debbie specifically said, we are very nerdy about HCD. We are passionate about what we do at CPE. And so if you have any questions, please reach out to us. We are happy to help you to identify a strategy that would work or talk you through a process. And we are more than happy to, um, you know, work with a school district, even if you're far away. I see we have some from, you know, a few hours away, we are happy to virtually meet with you and virtually do a training. So just reach out to us and um, let us know how we can help because we are aggressive helpers. <laughs> to quote Sarah. 
All right, so um, there is a link in the chat with our upcoming um, events. And these are more specifically a few things that we have going on. We are offering an Act 45 course using human-centered design to support student growth and achievement. So if HCD is something you are interested in, this might be a really great opportunity for you. Um, and then we have our two-day trainings coming up <clears throat> for both um, design thinking for educators, that's this stuff, or introduction to project-based learning. That is another thing that we are super nerdy about. So um, if you have any questions or need anything, please reach out to us. We are happy to help. And thank you so much for joining us today. We hope that this has been really helpful for you guys and at least given you a few ideas of how you can better engage with budgeting.